Uh, welcome to Chicago Jewish Cafe. Today, we have an honor to host um, Alexander Mottel, uh, a professor of Rutgers University. He is a professor, professor of political science. He's also a historian. He's written a number of books, and he specializes in history of Ukraine, Russia, Soviet Union. In general, that area, uh, which is of interest uh, to us at this particular moment, especially because of Russian war against Ukraine. Um, I have invited uh, Alexander uh, because uh, I have come across his article that he's written for Atlantic Council as a blog uh, seven years ago. And he was dealing there with the issue of uh, Russian fascism under Putin. And he made a prophetic statement there that um, although seven years ago, the use of this adjective uh, or noun fascism was uh, already taking place among uh, Russian critically thinking individuals in uh, the West, in the United States uh, in particular, that was not yet the norm. Now, it just so happened a while back, I have used the expression Russian fascism in one of uh, our um, videos um, for YouTube. And that video, YouTube blocked because it said that Russian fascism is a hate speech. Oh, my. Yeah. Thank God uh, uh, Facebook did not block it, and it is available on Facebook. But that is not what we're dealing with today here with Alexander. We're going to deal with the issue of Russian fascism, which is now, I think, it's clear for everybody in terms of the aggression against Ukraine, but also uh, because of the uh, uh, increasingly oppressive regime within Russia itself, that Putin and his people are building. That is the first part of our discussion. But the second part of our discussion is going to be dealing with Ukrainian Jewish relations, specifically with the Ukrainian understanding of uh, uh, how they want to deal with themselves and that and their reflection on the Jews in Ukraine. Uh, the issue of Ukrainian Israeli or Ukrainian other Jewish relations we're going to leave for maybe some other conversations, but right now uh, for Ukrainian self-identification and uh, the relationship with Jews. But let's start with the issue of Russian fascism. Alexander, what can you say about it? I mean, it seems like you're a little bit of a prophet. <laughs> well, you know what happens mostly to prophets, they get burned at the stake. So. I'm not sure. <laughs> I'm not sure how comfortable I am with that. But thank you. Thank you very much. I'll take that as a compliment. I mean, seven years ago, you said that this is what is going to happen, that this uh, 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 word is going to be used in the West. And it seems like it's increasingly being used in the West. But let me ask you a question. You've given in that article a number of different people's uh, uh, definition, characterization of what they meant by Russian fascism. What do you mean by Russian fascism? Well, the, the real question is, what do I mean by fascism? Uh, and then the question, then the second question is, does the political system that Vladimir Putin built in Russia, does it meet the defining characteristics of fascism? So my approach is very much a political science approach. I'm trying to be as objective as possible, especially because I appreciate, as you, as do you and many, and many other people, that fascism is a loaded term. People use it very, well, indiscriminately. Anybody they don't like is a fascist, and I'm trying to give it some kind of concrete meaning. Uh, so I read all the literature, or at least as much of it as I, you know, as I could, in English, some in Russian, some in other languages as well. And my uh, understanding of fascism is relatively straightforward. Um, it's a political system that is authoritarian. It could also be totalitarian, but it's at least authoritarian with a charismatic leader who has a cult of personality. 
Uh, there are other characteristics that we encounter when we look at Mussolini's Italy or Hitler's Germany or other fascist countries. But the, one th but the things that they all have in common is precisely the fact that they are uh, led, you know, authoritarian systems led by charismatic dictators uh, with a cult of personality. Um, and it seems to me that that applies to Italy under Mussolini. Uh, it certainly applies to places like Turkey under Ataturk. Um, and the, more, the important thing, and of course, it also applies to Russia. Um, and, and again, not because I necessarily wanted to, uh, but it seems to me that the system Putin built is authoritarian, and he clearly enjoys uh, a certain kind of charisma, has a certain kind of charisma, and has built a personality cult around himself. Uh, the important thing to keep in mind is that in contrast to run-of-the-mill, normal, typical authoritarianism, the key distinguishing characteristic of a fascist system is precisely this charismatic leader. Um, many authoritarian systems are simply led by non-entities, generals, colonels, military officers, uh, you know, somebody who happens to be there at the right place at the right time. Here, it's a specific kind of individual. A, and again, Mussolini fits the bill. So does Hitler. So does Ataturk, unfortunately. And of course, so does Vladimir Putin. I actually began writing about this in around 2006 or 2007. It was already then that I wrote an article asking, is Russia fascist? Um, and my conclusion was that it was fascist toyed, which is a terrible word, but all it means is that it's moving in that direction. Um, and since then, I've been pursuing this question of fascism, fascist toyed, and so on. Um, and as you probably know, the term never really caught on. Um, it did amongst Russian oppositionists and critics. Uh, increasingly, Russians themselves were talking about the Putin regime as fascist. Uh, but here in the West, the term only found favor amongst a handful of scholars. In recent months, or perhaps in recent years, well, certainly in recent months, I think there's been a significant turnaround, both in Russia, certainly in Ukraine, but also in, in the West. And now it's become extremely difficult to argue that this regime is not in some significant way fascist, because it's obviously authoritarian, it's arguably totalitarian, it's a militarist regime, it's imperialist, uh, it has a whole series of supremacist and arguably racist ideologies. Um, anyway, so you can just go down the list and the remarkable similarity between Putin's Russia, Mussolini's Italy and Hitler's Germany is striking, uh, striking in any case to me, but more than that, striking, I think, to many, many people um, in Russia, in Ukraine, in Eastern Europe, as well as in North America. Mm. Very interesting. And in your mind, what is the reason that Russians, I mean, the uh, 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 react to Putin that way and uh, made out of him a personality cult. What is the reason? Now, there are many reasons for that. And so in a way, it's overdetermined to use a social science term. Um, I would start with the following fact. And this is a comparison that, I, again, I've been pursuing this for about 25 years, since the 90s. And it's this notion of Weimar Russia. Uh, after the Soviet Union collapsed, Russia went into a tailspin. It experienced enormous economic, political, cultural difficulties, chaos. It lost an empire. It, was, it lost the state. I mean, it lost everything. And the situation within Russia in the 1990s was very similar to the situation in Weimar, Germany. And of course, who got blamed for the difficulties in Russia? Well, the same people who were blamed for the difficulties in Germany, 
and that is to say socialists, but more specifically Democrats. Um, and of course, with some individuals, it wasn't just Democrats, it was Democrats and Jews, right? Certainly in the German case, a little less so in the Russian case, but again, that's where you have the beginnings of this kind of more obvious anti-Semitism emerging. And in both cases, again, you have these chaotic circumstances, a, a feeling of humiliation on the part of the population. And then in both countries, the hero on the white horse comes in. In one case, it's Putin. In the other case, it's Hitler. Both promise to make the country great again. Both promise to revive national pride and everything else. And initially, they succeed. Um, you know, Hitler was very popular and he's, you know, he managed to eliminate unemployment just about, started a whole bunch of programs. Putin had the good luck of coming into power at precisely the time when energy prices rose. Uh, so he too was able to build on that. And then progressively their true characters started coming out. Uh, but in terms of the population, the population in both countries saw these individuals as their saviors as their messiahs. Now, in the Russian case, but also in the German case, but let me speak mostly now about Russia, there is also a long historical and political cultural tradition of, let's call it, Tsar worship. Um, and it goes back several centuries, uh, arguably, certainly it starts with, at least with Peter the Great, arguably centuries beforehand. But this notion of the Tsar Batyushka, who is going to save us, who is going to do everything in order to make our lives good. This is Means, very, uh, our father. Our father, yes. This is very deeply rooted in much of Russian political culture. It was reinforced by the Soviets with their cults of Lenin, cults of Stalin, cult even of Brezhnev. <laughs> it's hard to imagine, but there was a cult of Brezhnev, as you know. Um, and so Putin, I, I thought Brezhnev was uh, was only a bot of jokes, but I guess you say that there was people that were worshiping or liking a lot Brezhnev, huh? Well, the, the, the regime tried to make a cult. So they would have the paintings and the portraits and the banners and the poems and things like that. But of course, and, as and, you know, and the, me and the medals increasing and the medals. <laughs> Exactly, and the medals. But of course, again, it didn't work as well as with Lenin and Stalin. But the point is, I mean, the effort was made. So Putin was able to build on these longer traditions. Um, and in the process, you know, as I said, he did have some success. Uh, it's not his, I mean, I mean, it's not that he revived the economy, energy prices revived the economy, but he got the, uh, he got the gratitude for that. Um, and he was able then to use this to begin crafting a more imperial or more imperialist program. And that too appeals to many people because it means that Russia will be great again. Uh, Russia will have its moment in the sun once again. Um, and of course, many Russian intellectuals, professionals, are opposed or at least neutral to these ideas, but for 80, 85% of the population, this makes them feel good. Uh, this makes them feel good, especially since they're living, very often they're living in miserable conditions. And it's always nice to think you're superior, even though you're living in a slum. So what role does Russia's war against Ukraine play in this scenario of Russian fascism? Well, in a way, it's the logical outgrowth, outgrowth of Russian fascism, because part of the, at the core of the Russian, of Putin's ideology, is his obsession with Ukrainians. Uh, on the one hand, they're all Nazis. On the other hand, they don't exist. They don't deserve to exist. Um, and it's an obsession, again, that to me is- And, uh, and on the third hand, they're all, Russians. Yes, I know. Different. Exactly. So they're all Russians, but they right. don't exist and but they're they all don't. Nazis. Right. So you have this fantastic con a conglomeration of crazy ideas, uh, which to me rem is reminiscent of Hitler's notions about Jews. You know, they're evil. They're terrible. They're all over the place. Even if you don't see them, they're all over the place. <laughs> you know. It doesn't really it, it, matter. Especially, but especially if you don't see them. Especially, that's right, because then they're really at work. 
But I just, before you go further, I want to say, you know, that people around Putin, majority of his main, uh, I would not, want to say ideologues, but maybe facilitators of that ideology. Actually, he have Ukrainian roots, like Alexander yes. Dugin. Yes, yes, of course. And others. So how, so they, for example, Alexander Dugin's mother is Ukrainian. So mm -hmm. obviously for him, you know, being Russia and Ukraine, one is very uh, personal. Yes. And there are many, many others like that, of course. And, and which is, yeah, yeah. Yes, and please. during uh, during the czarist period, you know, most of uh, I mean, the, the the one of the biggest sources of anti-Semitism as ideology was Kiev Russians in Kiev. That is, Ukrainians with Russian roots in Kiev. Yes, yes, this is quite true. So I'm sorry for interrupting you. Please continue. I just wanted to make sure that we also address this issue, talking about unseen invisible and things like this but uh they do see things you know in their own way uh, continue please uh, uh. well uh, the again given that kind of ideology um ultimately it makes and, and of course given the fact that this ideology putin's obsession uh has been transmitted to a large portion of the population in russia again how many is hard to say we can only guess, but certainly very many seem to be on board. Uh, then the war, uh, and especially the way the war has been presented, it's a war of defense. It's a war of liberation. It's not a war of aggression. Uh, it's a war to stop Nazis. And again, I, I don't know where the Nazis are, but the point is they're all Nazis, so they simply have to be stopped. All of that begins to make sense given those kinds of premises and given that kind of ideology. Um, and, you know, so thus, now that's, that's on the one hand. On the other hand, uh, the expectation was that the war would end after a few days, possibly after a week or two. So the problem that Putin is facing now is that this war is now dragging into the 56th day. It's roughly two months. Uh, Russia clearly is not winning. Uh, many people within the Russian elite are now beginning to recognize that this was a disastrous decision. It was a strategic error of the first magnitude. And the question now is, how will that play itself out on the Russian mentality? Because, of course, um, grand and glorious little war, some, you know, somewhat similar to the seizure of Crimea in 2014, would obviously have been very popular and would have increased the legitimacy of Putin. But now it's become a quagmire, it's become a baloto, um, and there's no obvious end in sight. Um, and of course, increasingly body bags, dead soldiers, funerals are taking place. And now the interesting question is to what degree will that begin to affect Russian perceptions of Putin? Um, you know, if, one, one expects the enthusiasm for Putin to decline. Uh, but again, that's an expectation. When that will happen and to what degree, well, we'll see within the next few weeks or months. In my mind, he already lost. I mean, the Russian uh, army showed itself um, very, uh, I do not want to say very incompetent, but sufficiently incompetent in order to be able to take Kiev or anything else, you know, I mean, it, it seems like right now the goal, Putin's goal is just to get a piece of Ukraine and claim a victory. Right. I mean, that would seem to be the what was initially the program minimum is now becoming the program maximum. Whether he'll succeed, we'll see in the next week or two. Uh, this major battle is, you know, arguably has begun or will soon begin. Um, and that, of course, will be decisive in determining how this will turn out, at least in the short term. It's hard to imagine, at least for me, that Putin will be satisfied with some kind of ceasefire or peace accord that falls short of his ultimate goals. But it's hard to say. Maybe he might. Uh, it's also possible, of course, that you know a certain constellation of forces might emerge within the Russian elite 
and they might decide to push him out of office. It seems highly unlikely at this point in time, but you know, <laughs> the war seemed unlikely. Yeah, the Soviet yeah. Union's collapse seemed impossible. So we're living in the age of possible, uh, imp possible impossibilities. Yeah, well, uh, it just so happened that uh, not only I worked all my life for collapse of the communist dictatorship in the Soviet Union, but I predicted it. You know, as a commentator on NPR's Morning Edition and in uh, in these times, you know, my articles. But excellent. Thought, Yes, thank you. And but also talking about uh, the war in Ukraine now, I have to say that uh, Putin lost and um, the only problem and he's not going to go any further. I think he's going to be satisfied with uh, taking eastern Ukraine and then wait for another few years before restarting a new war against Ukraine. So my, my feeling is that Ukrainians need to fight now and um, but will they be able to? I'm not so sure um, to take because you need for advancement, you know, on the front, you need airplanes, jets, you need tanks, you need things like this. I mean, right now they're fighting defensive war, so the anti tank rockets is sufficient, but to go forward, to go, you need different equipment. We'll see what is going to happen. Um, anyway. This war, unlike the war 100 years ago, and unlike many other wars, uh, it seems like um, uh, the head of the Ukrainian state is a Jew. I mean, in all of the military conflicts of Ukrainians for the last three, 400 years, uh, Jews, their neighbors, were victims on grand scale at the hands of Ukrainians. Mm -hmm. This is the first time I see that there is no uh, such thing. First of all, there's very few Jews remaining, relatively few Jews remaining in Ukraine. Secondly, it seems like at least 80% of Jews are on the side of Ukraine against Russia. I mean, uh, in 2014, out of 82 people on Maidan, uh, three victims were Jews. That is. 10 times the number of Jewish population in Ukraine. Mm -hmm. um, and today, instead of Petlura, we have Zelensky fighting for independence of Ukraine. Yes, yes. Um, God has a lot of ways to make uh, fun of our understanding of history and of life. Now, I have to say, I asked you, you know, after you agreed uh, for this interview, I asked you also for a copy of your book, A Jew Who Was Ukrainian. Mm -hmm. um, I do not know if it's funny, funny comedy, but it is presented as a comedy. I, I have to say that you're a good writer. I liked uh, the way you write. You, you, uh, I'm surprised that this book is no longer in print, but um, I have given, without your permission, this copy to several of my Ukrainian friends for them to take a look and talk to me about it. They haven't gotten back to me on that yet. I read, uh, not completely because there was no time, but more than half of the book. And uh, I, I have to say, you know, I recommend it very highly for this book to be back in print and uh, for people to be buying it because it's a it's a book uh, on one hand uh, uh, comedy but on the other hand it does contain a lot of um, factual information about Jewish Ukrainian history. Uh, yes. Today, yeah, today uh, as I said, you know, we do not have pogroms like a hundred years ago. Uh, many people say, you know, that Petlura's forces, you know, um, uh, killed 50,000. You, that's your figure in the book. Uh, I say more than 150,000 because there's many people that were not counted that were killed as a result. But more importantly than that, um, my 
uh, understanding of that part of history. By the way, Piklura's monument is in Vinitsa, the town I am from. Oh, is that right? Oh. Yeah. And um, so the uh, Chikalov Street in Vinitsa now is Piklura Street. And the uh, building next to which his monument is um, uh, the building that was owned by a Jewish manufacturer um, and that Petlura as a socialist expropriated. That is took without paying for it anything. Hmm. Good Lenin's approach to solving some of the problems. But what I'm saying is this, the turning point something that you did not mention in your book when you were talking about Schwarzbart killing Pitlura in 1926. The turning point, the way I see it, was February 15th, 1919. This is after that, the Jews of Ukraine turned against Ukrainian nationalists. That is the date of Praskurov's pogrom, in which something like 1,800 people were murdered. Now, after that, Jews had no choice because until then, what was stopping them was the Bolsheviks' demand for nationalization of industry, private businesses, and things like this. And uh, most of Jews were working, you know, as small uh, businessmen, I do not know if you call it business or traders, you know, buy, sell, whatever it is. By the way, uh, before we go further on this comedy of your book, I wanted to tell you a joke that I heard a few days ago. Um, two guys, two Jewish guys, uh, talking to each other in Odessa. And one guy turns to another and says, FEMA, uh, why did you switch from Russian to English? Jews no longer speak Yiddish, you know, like a long time ago, so now, <laughs> from, from Russian to Yiddish, and says, because I did not want Putin to come and save us. <laughs> yeah, so Putin is a, <clears throat> Very things, good. Things change. Um, but uh, in your, uh, uh, I do not know how in the world did you come up with this, uh, this narrative of uh, uh, a Jewish uh, 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 major, I think, of uh, NKVD, you know, Stalin's secret police, raping Ukrainian um, pro-Nazi anti-Semitic woman who served in Auschwitz, and then living together. I, Never understood why they did not divorce each other. I mean, first of all, why she did not have an abortion? I mean, why why did she need to carry through with it, given that she hates Jews so much and that that guy hates Ukrainians so much? <laughs> well, it's a good question, but then there would have been no novel. No novel. <laughs> and then this guy, Volodymyr, is it coincidence? Volodymyr, you know, like Zelensky, the same name. Volodymyr, Frauen Zimmer. Frauen Zimmer, what, what, what is it? A woman's uh, toiletry room or what, what, what is it? How do you? It's, a, it's it? an old German word for woman. Frauen? Nowadays, Frauen Zimmer. Nowadays, you wouldn't say it anymore. It would be regarded as insulting. What, what, what would be the closest translation for insult? What, what, what would it be? <laughs> oh, God. I mean, literally, it means women's room. Well, that's what I thought. You know, yeah, women's room. Yeah. In, in Russia, there is such thing as zhenske uborna, ili zhenske toilet. No. <laughs> but it, no, it, that wouldn't be the same thing. It just literally, but it, it literally meant women. Uh, Frau and Simmer were simply women or a woman. Anyway, in your book, he is so uncomfortable with this last name, and he wants to change it and did not find any way changing, but I wanted to know, you know, what exactly was trying, because to me, Frauen Zimmer is like uh, any other German last name. But in any case, so uh, this guy also wants to kill 
Russian uh, leader. Right. Now, and he goes, what, to Moscow to do it? He goes to Moscow to do it, and he ultimately doesn't succeed. Does not succeed. But I, should, I shouldn't tell you. <laughs> why, why shouldn't? The book is not in print. Right, there you go. So no one can find out the truth anyway. But no, but he doesn't succeed. Why it's not in print? Well, because I, I think it was several hundred copies were printed, and then they, they were sold out. Uh, you know, the book's been in print for about 10 years or so. Well, I, I think um, it should be put back in print. I mean, it's, uh, I do not know how many, but by the way, who was it written to? I mean, uh, for, uh, the, when I read it, you know, there's such expressions, you know, uh, bones of the Zek. No English speaking individual will understand what Zek is. No, I know, I know. And, and one of the women in the, in the book is called Katorga. Katarga, yeah. Katarga, right. Yeah. So, so what, what, what yeah. is it? I mean, uh, it means. Well, it's, it, the books are intended for educated readers. I, um, I think it would be appropriate for Russian reader. Was it translated into Russian? No, no, unfortunately not. Or Ukrainian? I, I, yeah. I think Ukrainian would not be a good language to translate because the only people that would read this book are Jews like me. <laughs> A Jew who was Ukrainian, like you. <laughs> well, it, it's not simply uh, who was Ukrainian, uh, but who um, is interested in this uh, in this problem, in this question, in this problem, in this question. Yeah, because yeah. it could be, you know. Uh, by the way, this is an interesting thing, you know, uh, uh, that today uh, the title of the book uh, could be, you know, not. A, a, simply a Jew who was Ukrainian, but a Jew who was, who was Ukrainian Jew, you know, because until actually this war, uh, there still remained leftovers of the Soviet Jewry, mm -hmm. not only in the United States and Israel, but also in the territory of uh, former Soviet Union. Of course. But this war, this aggression, this horrible thing that Putin started, it divided Jews in Russia from Jews in Ukraine. And not simply divided, but across the family lines. Mm -hmm. I mean, uh, my, my division from my family in Russia was of different causes and from some time back. But for example, my, uh, the division between my uh, cousin in Vinitsa and uh, uh, our relatives in Moscow was the result of this war because mm. she is for Ukraine and those are against Ukraine for Putin. So mm. now you have this, uh, Putin, by the way, uh, created something that uh, I, I don't think he intended to create. First of all, he really created Ukrainian nation. Yes, that's absolutely true. So, uh, and... Let's continue this thing, because what is the attitude, given the history of this Ukrainian nation, possibly in your mind, would be with regard to Jews? Not simply Jews. Uh, uh, um, actually, we can talk about Jews in Ukraine, although I do not know what there is to talk about. There's only 50,000 Jews, you know, who say they're Jewish. But and the number is larger. It's about 300,000. Well, it's, uh, it seems like this is the number of people who are entitled to make uh, aliyah, that is, immigrate and get mm -hmm. instantaneously Israeli citizenship in Israel. But the number of those people that consider themselves Jews uh, seems like within 40, 50,000, uh, maybe maximum 80,000. I see. Okay. So most of those people, because they're uh, offsprings of um, uh, mixed marriages, they uh, more uh, living in Ukraine, they consider themselves Ukrainian, not Jewish. For example, this, uh, 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 my cousin, uh, who, you know, I, I say cousin because actually it does not sound as close as we are because I, I always called her my sister, you know, because in Dvayuradnaya uh, mm -hmm. you know, uh, is always, you know, it's like, like 
дядя Коля was my favorite дядя, you know, Ukrainian guy. So, and she always identified herself as Ukrainian in passport. She was Ukrainian. She was not Jewish. Um, she was a teacher. But now she is reluctantly, you know, is associating with Jews because she goes there and gets food and uh, mm -hmm. assistance and things like this in Jewish community. But uh, so there's, I mean, she's, her mother is Jewish. Her father is Ukrainian, uh, no longer alive. And uh, uh, and there's many people like that, but she always considers herself Ukrainian. Mm -hmm. um, and this is why those two, three hundred thousand that you mean, yeah, they're there. But, I see what you mean. But most of them do not consider themselves to be Jews. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. I, I mean, even the president of Ukraine, that is Zelensky, <laughs> only recently started talking about himself as Jewish. I mean. Although everybody always knew that he was a Jew. Right, right. So my question to you is, as a prophet, uh, <laughs> you, do not, you do not want to be a prophet. What is your vision for the future of uh, uh, Jews in Ukraine or Ukrainian Jews? Well, assuming that the war turns out more or less favorably. Uh, so that's obviously the premise. I'm working with. I, 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 I believe, as I said, Ukrainians already won. Right. Without um, any doubt. I mean, Russia cannot win this war. It could not win that war when troops came there for exercises next to the border. It was the end of that war. It was already clear. And what, and as I said, you know, that they will cross and they will, they will not win. Right. But, I mean, I agree but, with you. I agree with you. But my own personal view of the future of Ukrainian Jewish relations is very positive. I'm very optimistic. I'm very hopeful. Um, I've, when I look at the last five, 10, 20, 30 years within Ukraine, I look at the Ukrainian community, at the ethnic Ukrainians, I look at the ethnic Jews. And what to me is overwhelmingly the case is that both communities are coming together. Um, obviously, there are exceptions. I don't want to suggest that everything is perfect, but in general, it's remarkable how both communities are coming together, and they're coming together to create, as Vitaly Portnikov has said, right, a political Ukrainian nation, a political Ukrainian nation within which ethnic Ukrainians, ethnic Jews, ethnic Russians, ethnic Crimean Tatars, a whole bunch of different communities can live peacefully, prosperously, side by side, interact under this larger aegis of the Ukrainian political nation. And in that sense, someone like Zelensky is the prototype. And before him, of course, there was also Hreisman. He was the prime minister, also Jewish. This was under uh, the last president. Oh, also from Vinitsa. Also from Vinitsa, exactly, where he had happened to be mayor before he came to Kiev. But these, but Zelensky especially, especially given his role in the war, because as you know, before the war, he had a, his first half year was pretty good. And then things started kind of going all over the place. He was criticized by everybody. And now he's emerged as the symbol. I have to of, say he was criticized rightfully from my point of view. Oh yeah, yeah, I mean, again. Was, he was not a good president. He, he was at best, <laughs> okay, but now he's turned into a remarkable leader. He's found himself. Yeah. And the fact that he is Jewish is absolutely central to the future of Ukraine. Yes. Because it proves that Ukrainians, I mean, that a Ukrainian can be Jewish and that a Jew can be Ukrainian, so to speak. Uh, and that tension that I was talking about in my novel, mm -hmm. you know, the father versus the mother, and then poor Volodymyr in between, who doesn't know how to resolve these issues. Um, and the only way he can resolve it is by means of violence. And of course, he, he fails, but that's besides the point. That tension, I think, is beginning to dissipate. I th more than that, is it is dissipating. It is dissipating. 
there are obviously still going to be all sorts of historical issues. And that will require a lot of sensitivity and a lot of research and a lot of conversation. But it's going to be a conversation within a Ukrainian political nation. It's not going to be between Jews who are outside and Ukrainians who are inside. Everybody will be inside. And I think that will be the decisive difference. Um, again, that's somewhat, I, this may be a little idealistic, but when I look at Jewish activists in Ukraine, I look at my, my friends here in the United States, uh, my Jewish friends here in the United States, I look at Ukrainians here in the US and their attitude towards Jews. It's remarkable. It is simply remarkable. I think we've turned and we are embarking on a new future. Uh, now, what that new, what that identity will be like, what will that political nation look like, what will its rights and rituals be like, that's a work in progress. It's hard to say. Uh, Ukrainians will contribute, Jews will contribute, uh, Russians will contribute. I mean, increasingly, maybe Americans and Canadians and Europeans will contribute. Poles will probably contribute a great deal. So it's a work in progress, but I'm hopeful. I think we, I think despite the fact that this war has been such a an atrocity such a tragedy and has cost so many lives and has produced so much destruction i think that once we're out of this uh ukraine will be a very much better place hmm. especially with regard to this to this key relationship between ukrainians and jews this is very interesting uh you mentioned portnikov and positively um, I watched uh, his uh, most recent um, statement uh, uh, regarding the way he sees Ukraine, and uh, I got calls from other people that watched him too uh, that were not positive. Mm. In fact, what he was talking about, that is Ukrainian-speaking nation, I have no problem with Ukrainian being the state language of Ukraine. No problem. But uh, the way he was talking about it was, it seems like there was no room for any other language in Ukraine. I mean, we know that this caused language, at least as a trigger point, caused the problem with the uh, secessionism in the East and also causing the problems in Zakarpatia, that is uh, post-Carpathian mountains region, which has a lot of Hungarians. Uh, now, for Jews in Ukraine, that is no longer <clears throat> the issue the way it was 100 years ago where when Petlura, you know, put Yiddish on the money of Ukraine and things like this as a sign of goodwill toward the Jews. Um, so, but Portnikov, with the way he was talking, he was talking about uh, Ukraine that sounded, to me at least, as if it was Dunsov who was talking. That is, ethnically, uh, uh, religiously, the uh, language-wise uh, 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 unified society. Right. It did not seem to me that he was talking about the way you just described it, that sounded to me like... Um, uh, multicultural unified society, uh, society unified based on some kind of a uh, civic identity. He was, the way he was talking, at least the way I took him, was uh, on the basis of ethnic identity. Right. Well, again, you know, Partnikov is entitled to his opinions, uh, but the fact that you know, someone like Parknikov, who does happen to be of Jewish background, is sounding like Dunsov, mm -hmm. uh, is interesting. Um, I don't think he's ever going to become Dunsov, simply by virtue <laughs> of who he is. And, you know, uh, I mean, he's just too smart, let me put it that way. He's just too smart to be that. Uh, so I'm not sure I would worry. I, I do think two things have to be kept in mind. Um, well, certainly one, let me just mention that, is that Thanks to the war, thanks to this aggression and the genocide and the war crimes, I mean, call them whatever you like, but these atrocities that are being committed, especially 
in regions that are inhabited by Russians and Russian speakers. Uh, I mean, if Putin were doing this in Galicia, well, okay, that might make some kind of sense, but he's ostensibly, he says he wants to liberate Ruski Mir. So he's fighting, he would, he, he's fighting uh, 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 Banderovce, you know, Bandera, in Mariupol. In Mariupol. <laughs> yeah, it doesn't make any sense. Um, and what I've noticed already, again, this is just impressionistic, but I've noticed from reading the various internet sites, social media, conversations with friends, is that there is currently taking place a fairly impressive grassroots backlash against the Russian language. Mm -hmm. And people who were speaking Russian are trying to transition either to Ukrainian or to some kind of surzhik or some combination of the two. Uh, because what Putin has done is he's weaponized Russian. He's transformed it into the language of the oppressor. Um, and since there is no choice for people in Ukraine, regardless of whether they're ethnic Ukrainian, Jewish, or anybody else, but to associate with their homeland, um, that means that the language of the oppressor is the language that you've been speaking thus far, and it then becomes the language that you want to push away. Uh, so I think a lot of what Pognikov may have in mind will probably take place spontaneously from the grassroots. Um, personally, I can't imagine that Ukraine will ever become monolingual. Uh, there are just too many cultural forces from all sorts of directions. But I do think that grassroots pressure will be there. Uh, at the same time, remember, uh, whether it's Portnikov, Zelensky, Poroshenko, or any of these other people, uh, they are genuinely committed to a kind of liberal democratic vision of Ukraine. Uh, you know, some more, some less. Uh, but in general, they are, you know, they're, they're good guys. Um, so I don't think that as long as they're in power, and I think they will remain in power due to the war, uh, that they will try to impose some kind of mono-ethnic, illiberal, undemocratic vision. Um, so I, again, I, I remain hopeful. I remain hopeful despite Portnikov's comments that may cause some concern. Well, I, I join you in your hopefulness, uh, but I have to say, you know, that war uh, causes damage uh, not only to losers like Russia and Putin, I hope, but also to winners mm -hmm. because it uh, produces a different personality, a different yes. desire, what is a different uh, understanding of what is permissible to do with regard to people close to you. Now, yes. I, I do not see that there's going to be uh, uh, some uh, uh, repeat of pogroms or uh, things against Jews. I do not see that. Uh, mm -hmm. But what I'm talking about, uh, what I do see, what I'm afraid of is that um, the vision of Donsov may come out victorious. That is because his vision is actually um, um, unified Ukrainian nation based on uh, genes, on the uh, origin, on the ethnic belonging. Because let's not forget that there's difference among ethnic Ukrainians as well. That is between Western Ukrainians and uh, uh, Greek or Catholics and Russian and Ukrainian Orthodox. So there's problem between Russian Orthodox, Ukrainian Orthodox and Greek or Catholics in the West. So, but you see, I, I think that's I mean, that's been one of the features, the key, one of the central characteristics of Ukraine for the last thirty years, that it, that it's so pluralistic. Um, I mean, for better or for worse, some people think that's good, some people think it's bad. But it's you know, it's ten religions, <laughs> twenty nations. I'm personally of the opinion, and I've been of this opinion for a long time, that it won't be Donsov's vision that w wins. I think it will be Vyacheslav Lipinski's. Mm. Well, uh, you know, you know, um, you, you know that I am on your side on that one. But the thing is that, uh, uh, as I say, you know, that war produces. I mean, Donsov himself, you know, grew out of that war. I mean, initially in 1920, he was not yet fascist that he became. Mm -hmm. 
No, he was a socialist initially. Yeah. And so, uh, and the same way the war today uh, in Ukraine may produce a particular new attitude. Now, my, you know, look at this. Uh, the, the, the origin of Ukrainians, if we could, can talk about origins, you know, uh, are Cossacks, you know, are bandits. And one good thing about bandits is that they like individual freedom. I mean, for all the bad things that they do, they like individual freedom. When I was last time in Ukraine, 2019, uh, and many times before that, the thing I enjoyed the most was a sense of freedom that you could sense simply just by walking and talking to people People were not afraid to say this, to speak their mind. You could talk about anything you want. And that uh, debate on the stadium between Poroshenko and Zelensky was 10,000 people, you know, giving two speakers, you know, going at each other a different, you know, political ideas, you know. And uh, in 30 years, well, in a thousand years in Russia, there was never elected head of state. But in 30 years in Ukraine, there was six. That's what is attractive about Ukraine. If Ukraine is not free, is not democratic, is not capable of letting Jews be Jews in Ukraine, that Ukraine I don't need. I agree, but I think most Ukrainians at this point in time would agree with you. And if it is, I'd be willing to go and fight for it today, despite mm -hmm. the fact that I have hernia. <laughs> You've got a great sense of humor. Thank you. But the good news is, I think, is that the vast majority of Ukrainians would agree with you. Well, that's what I, they would want. I'm glad to hear that. You know, and, that's what uh, they would want as well. Um, and in any case, that's what people like you and me, that's what we have to fight for. That's, um, what, that's what we are fighting for. Yes. Yeah. The, I, I stand corrected. That's a yeah, good point. And, and also, I have to say, I have to add, you know, given the fascistic nature of the Putin's Russia, and I say it without any, ex in my mind, without any exaggeration, because, my God, it's not only war against Ukraine, but it's also the tightening of the screws on the Russian society, you know. The, uh, I mean, uh, yeah, you can compare it uh, under communism. It, it was much worse than it is under this fascist regime of Putin. But uh, if, if you take our Jews out of history, when you take a look at Nazi Germany, by comparison with Stalin's Russia, Stalin's Russia also was much worse than Nazi, Nazi Germany. It's true. If you take out the Jewish. Yes, if you take right. out Jewish. I mean, when you talk about the treatment of their own people. Yeah, yeah. So That's quite in, true. In that respect. But, but uh, in Russia, the way I see it is going just absolutely. Uh, he has gone and wrong. This is just absolutely. But. What I want to say was that today Ukrainians defend not only their independence, not only their freedom in my mind, but the life of the entire humanity, because Russia has gone absolutely crazy, absolutely bonkers. That's a very good way of putting it, and I agree with you completely. Uh, so I say Slava Ukraini. Heroin Slava. Slava. Особенно еврейским героям. Uh, спасибо. Thank you, you know, for the acknowledgement. But I do not know why особенно. No, uh, uh, because it, we uh, want to construct, we want to construct this political nation. Yes. That's why. Yes. And Jews are critical. They are the critical link. Well, I, I have to say uh, uh, that at this horrible moment for Ukraine, in my mind, I think Ukraine is very lucky to have a Jew as a president and who did not take the offer of Biden to run to Lviv. Yes, yes. Because if I he agree did, completely. If he did, the army, the whole desire to fight back against would collapse. Mm -hmm. So, and as I said, you know, I'm completely on the side.
of Ukraine. In any case, Alexander, nice speaking to you, nice talking to you, and um, uh, I wish your book uh, was back in print, and uh, hopefully one day it will be, and will be translated into Russian, because in Russian, it will have much greater impact than it ever had in English. Oh, well, thank you so much for the encouragement. I'll try to do that. Yeah. In any case, you have a great day. And you too, Alexander. It was a real pleasure. It was my pleasure. You have a great day. Take care. Right. Thank you for coming. Bye-bye. Take care.